Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our program on the George Marshall statue. My name is Susan Van Epps, and I work for Loudoun County Public Library, and I'll be your host today. Just as a reminder, anyone who has any questions during the presentation is welcome to put them down in the chat box in the lower right corner, and I will ask our presenter the questions at the end of the program. And now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Tom Bowers. Mr. Bowers was a docent at George Marshall's Madonna Center in Leesburg from 2010. I'm sorry, 2010 to 2021. He was a professor and a dean at the School of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina from 1971 to 2006. As a U.S. Army officer, he served at the Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe from 1965 to 1968. Welcome, Mr. Bowers. Thank you, Susan. And I'm welcome to everybody who is uh, listening. I hope we can proceed without any any more glitches. The dedication of the George Marshall statue in Leesburg in 1980 was probably the biggest event in town history. There was a week of activities, church services, speeches by national leaders, a parade that featured VMI cadets and color guards. That was appropriate because George Catlett Marshall was the most famous and most important person who has ever lived in Leesburg. He was a graduate of the Virginia Military Institute. He rose through the ranks of the United States Army to the very top as Army Chief of Staff during World War II. As such, he was Eisenhower's boss, he was MacArthur's boss, he was Patton's boss. He was the most important military advisor to Presidents Franklin Roosevelt and Harry Truman. And he worked closely with international leaders such as British Prime Minister Winston Churchill and Soviet Premier Joseph Stalin. After the war, he was special envoy to China, where he tried to broker a peaceful uh, government, coalition government between the communist and the nationalist. He served as Secretary of State from 1947 to 1948. During that time is when the Marshall Plan was developed. It was officially called the European Recovery Program. It was a $13 billion program that saved the economies of the war-torn countries of Europe. And because of his efforts on behalf of that program, it became known as the Marshall Plan. He was president of the American Red Cross and secretary of defense during the first years, first year of the Korean War. And in 1953, he won the Nobel Peace Prize, primarily for his efforts on behalf of the Marshall Plan. He and his wife, Catherine, lived at Dodona Manor in Leesburg from 1941 until his death in 1959. Today, Dodona Manor is open as a house museum. It's also the home of the George C. Marshall International Center, which is dedicated to preserving the legacy of George Marshall. Marshall could also be seen in Leesburg, working in his garden, attending meetings of the Rotary Club or the Men's Garden Club, and occasionally shopping, as this photograph shows him, at a lease in a Leesburg grocery store, checking a shopping list. And it's quite obvious that it must have been raining that day. Marshall had been born in uh, Uniontown, Pennsylvania on December 31st, 1880. And in 1977, a group of people in Leesburg began to think about ways to celebrate the centennial of Marshall's birth. They considered naming a street after him, but they finally decided 
to uh, have a statue of Marshall placed on the courthouse lawn. Ben Lawrence was chairman of the committee. Lawrence was a Loudoun County businessman who had been affiliated with the Federal Aviation Administration, and he had headed the county's celebration of the bicentennial in 1976. B. Powell Harrison was another prominent Leesburg businessman. Vinton Pickens was a local artist. Huntington Harris was another former businessman in Leesburg. Thomas Kamstra was a local architect. Leslie Cheek was a former director of the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, and she was an art advisor to the committee. And Stephen Price, a local attorney, was the legal advisor to the committee. 50 sculptors expressed an interest in doing the Marshall sculpture. And that list of 50 was narrowed down to three sculptors who submitted what were called competition statues. They were about a quarter size of the anticipated final version of the statue, and they were to look like what the sculpture intended to do. And they were supposed to be about a quarter size. They were made out of plaster of Paris. One of those was William McVeigh. He was best known for a nine foot sculpture of Winston Churchill at the British Embassy in Washington, DC. He had also done bronze doors for the Federal Trade Commission building in Washington, DC, and a statue of Olympic athlete, Jesse Owens. Una Hanbury, was an English-born sculptor who lived in Washington, D.C. from 1944 until the early 1970s. She was better known as a painter. And Rosario Fiore was selected to do the sculpture on the basis of this competition statue. He was a native of New York, but he was living on Jekyll Island, Georgia. He said that he had once met George Marshall. He said he had read Marshall's life story, and I got the feeling that he was a very compassionate man, very decisive, very strong in his convictions, and also a very marvelous individual in the cause of humanity. And if you notice the statue, uh, Couple of things about it. First of all, Marshall is wearing a sweater. He is, has a tie on. In his left hand, he has a book, and his right hand appears that it is going it is rest will be resting on something. The celebration began when Governor John Dalton declared December sixth as George Marshall Day in Virginia. On October 23rd, a, mu a collection of Marshall memorabilia opened at, Loud at the Loudoun Museum, and it was uh, on display there for the remainder of the year. And on Sunday, November 30th, several local religious leaders recognized Marshall and his character in their church services. Tuesday, December 2nd, was George Marshall Day in Lovettsville. There was a reception at the home of Mr. and Mrs. Robert Riddlemoser and a speech by, Mr. by Fred Hadzel, who was director of the George C. Marshall Research Foundation and Library in Lexington, Virginia. People at the, at the program also saw a film about uh, George Marshall. On December 3rd, there was a reception for Fiore at the home of Vinton Pickens. She lived at Janelia Farm, which today is the home of the Howard Hughes Institute. She amused the guests by saying that although George, Mar although George Washington 
had not slept in her house. The house was built in the 1930s, by the way. She did say that George Marshall had swum in her swimming pool. On December 4th, a Rotary Club program at the Laurel Brigade Inn featured a speech by Averill Harriman. He was a diplomat who had worked with Marshall during World War II and later in the State Department. He was 89 years old and he owned property in Loudoun County. He recalled a visit that he had made to see Marshall at Dodona Manor on July 4th, 1950, when he talked to Marshall about President Truman's request that Marshall become Secretary of Defense. Harriman recalled that Marshall said, I'm ready if my country needs me. Harriman also said that Marshall's wife, Catherine, was standing by and he saw tears in her eyes as she realized what that conversation meant, that George Marshall was going to be called away again for government service. December 5th featured a band concert at Loudoun County High School featuring the Marine Corps Presidential Band. A special guest that day was Barbara Huddleston Abney Hastings, the 13th Countess of Loudoun from Scotland. Loudoun County was named after her ancestors. She had been in Leesburg in 1976 for the bicentennial celebration and won the hearts of Leesburg citizens. She said that she accepted the invitation to come to the festivities because she said, we in Europe owe so much to the Marshall Plan and General Marshall was such a great man and a great general. Saturday, December 6th was an overcast day. The temperature was about 50 degrees. Ronald Reagan had been elected president a month earlier. He had been invited to come to the, to the ceremony, but he had not responded. President Jimmy Carter had been invited, but he declined the invitation. About 3,000 people lined King Street for the parade that began at the Virginia Village parking lot and proceeded north to the clubhouse. 700 cadets from Virginia Military Institute marched in the parade, as did color guard units from the Army, Navy, Marines, Coast Guard, and Great Britain. Children lined both sides of King Street, waving tiny American flags. As the parade went by, one woman who had been standing on the sideline ran out into the street and shouted, waved a flag and shouted, I'm getting in this parade. And many other spectators joined her as they, as they marched up the street. As the last VMI company marched by, a squadron of jet fighter planes streaked overhead. The ceremony ended at the courthouse where a platform had been set up. On the platform were Averill Harriman, Ben Lawrence, the Reverend John Smith of St. James Episcopal Church, Virginia Lieutenant Governor Charles Robb, Carl Hendrickson, Chairman of the Loudoun County Board of Supervisors, Steve Price, Molly Wynn, who was George Marshall's stepdaughter, and Senator Harry Byrd of Virginia, who introduced the speaker. Dean Rusk had served under Marshall in the State Department and later was Secretary of State himself under Presidents John Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson from 1961 to 1969. In his speech, Rusk lauded Marshall's many achievements, being a guiding force in the Army between the World Wars, 
leadership during World War II, envoy to China, Secretary of State, and Secretary of Defense. Rusk said that Marshall's watchword was, yes, Mr. President. The week-long festivities ended on December 7th with a service at St. James, where the Reverend John Smith described Marshall as a humble man who helped others to search themselves and to seek out God for strength. After the war, Smith said, Marshall helped destroyed nations reach down and capture and discover their own resources. James Wynn Jr., Jimmy Wynn, Marshall's step-grandson, read the epistle, which drew on Isaiah's hope that the Messiah would come. In closing, Smith said that Marshall and John the Baptist led others to a spiritual relationship with God, the source of all hope. This photograph shows the Marshall statue at its original location near the courthouse. This right here today is the law library. And you can see it shows Marshall standing in front of a rail fence. And you'll recognize from the competition statue wearing a tie and a sweater and holding a book. Behind him were some granite blocks inscribed with soldier, statesman, citizen friend, George Catlett Marshall. The cost of the project, the statue and the stonework, was about $100,000, which would be about $300,000 in today's dollars. The sculptor, Fiore, said that he hoped the statue would show the presence of the general standing there and also of an understanding and compassionate man and a local citizen. That original location can be seen in this photograph. You see the uh, picnic table sitting. This is the law library here. The picnic table sitting here. That's the approximate location of where the statue was originally. The statue remained on the courthouse square for 20 years, but they were moved to a Loudoun County storage facility in 1999 because of the construction of the new courts building. And it was supposed to be temporarily. It was taken to a Loudoun County storage facility where it was resting. And Ben Lawrence told me that he went out there one day to see the statue and found it lying on the ground, surrounded by weeds. And he made sure that the people there knew that that was not appropriate and that, and that they put the statue upright. Once the construction was completed, uh, people began to think about a new plan for the courthouse area. Judge Thomas Horn, who was chief judge of the Loudoun County Circuit Court at the time, had responsibility for the courthouse grounds and led the discussions about what to do in the courthouse area. They developed a a, a, an architectural and landscaping plan. And it soon became apparent that most people thought that the Marshall statue would not fit in those new plans. One person said that with all the monuments and memorials in the, stat in the courthouse area, the place had the appearance of a graveyard. People Judge, Judge Horn and others finally concluded that Dodona Manor would be the proper place for a new home for the Marshall statue. That had not been uh, possible in 1980 when the statue was developed because Marshall's stepdaughter, Molly Wynn, 
was still living in Dodona Manor with her husband, Colonel James Wynn. James Wynn died in 1990. And in 1995, Molly Wynn sold Dodona Manor to the George C. Marshall Home Preservation Fund. And, that's when, and then the George C. Marshall International Center and Dodona Manor Museum opened in November of 1995. In 2007, Loudoun County, which retains ownership of the statue, loaned it to the George C. Marshall International Center and paid to have it moved to Dodona Manor, where it sits on East Market Street across from Mom's Apple Pie. And it was rededicated there on Veterans Day in 2007. And that relocation had been supported by a number of people and organizations in Leesburg. The granite blocks remained at the county facility until 2017 when they were moved to the rear of the Marshall House property. The Marshall statue was not universally greeted warmly by some people in Leesburg. Sergeant William Hefner had been Marshall's orderly, which means personal servant. And he lived in Dodona Manor with the Marshalls. And Hafner was upset because he said that George Marshall never walked around Leesburg in a sweater with a book in his hand. Hefner said that Marshall, if Marshall was out in town, he always wore a coat and tie but never had a book in his hand. Kitty Wynn, Marshall's step-granddaughter, said she thought the statue was a poor representation of her stepfather. She said her mother had appreciated the statue, but she never commented, her mother never commented on the statue's appearance. The size of the statue was an, is an issue and remains somewhat of a mystery. I am, this photograph shows me standing next to the Marshall statue. I am six feet tall. George Marshall was six feet tall. This statue shows Marshall as being seven and a half feet tall with a disproportionately large head. Marshall's hat size was seven and a half, which is approximately 24 inches in circumference. We know that because there are some of Marshall's hats at Dodona Manor. I took one of those hats to the statue one day and tried to put it on his head and it would only sit on top of it. The circumference of this, of the head on the statue is about 34 inches which is probably equivalent to a hat size of probably 10 or even larger. The committee had visited Fiore in his studio. They went up to look at the completed statue before it was shipped to Leesburg. They asked Fiore, they questioned the height of the statue and its oversized head. And Fiore told them that he had used mathematical calculations to determine the size of the statue and the head. So it looks as if one reason for the size may have been miscalculations about it. His competition statue was about 30 inches high. If it were the standard size, it suggested a completed statue of about 10 feet. The logical explanation for the oversize of the statue has to do with a fairly common practice among sculptors. If a statue is to be placed on a pedestal, 
so that people look up to it. The statue is made larger than life, so it will appear more normal or more natural to the people who are standing below it. However, there doesn't seem to have been any indication leading up to the statue, the creation of the statue, of having it sit on a pedestal that probably had maybe had to do with cost, but it doesn't appear that a, st a pedestal was ever considered. There is a life-size statue of George Marshall. It's in Uniontown, Pennsylvania. You see him on horseback with a dog at his side. And, oh, what might have been. This was the competition statue submitted by William McVeigh. It shows Marshall seated on something, although it's you can't tell what that is. And the competition statue suffered some damage while it was in storage. So this would have shown Marshall seated. And you will all probably all recognize this, another seated statue in Leesburg of Stanley Calkins sitting on a bench in front of what used to be his store. And oh, if what it, what, what it would have been like if Marshall's statue had been like that so that people would feel like they would sit down and even have a conversation with him. I mentioned that the celebration around the statue was probably the biggest event in Leesburg history. There was another big event, I'll mention this just briefly, occurred in 1825 when this man, the Marquis de Lafayette, who was a Revolutionary War hero, a French army officer, came back to the United States for what people today might call a farewell tour. He, he spent, he was at the home of President James Monroe at Oak Hill, south of Leesburg. He rode on horseback to Leesburg. As he came into town, there was a cannonade. There was a luncheon held for him on the courthouse lawn, and he rode around on Loudoun Market and King Streets, spent the night at the Eagle Hotel, and the next morning went to Temple Hall, and then went on to the Belmont Plantation. So that's the story of the George Marshall statue and the mystery of its size. And I'm curious if anybody who is watching today was in Leesburg in 1980 and saw the statue in its original location, or perhaps might have been at the ceremony on December 6th. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tom. That was really interesting. And um, yes, anyone who has a question can, or a comment is welcome to put it down in the chat box and I will relay them to Tom. I, I was going to ask you the same thing. I was going to say, were you by chance in Leesburg or in Loudoun County on December 6th in 1980? No, I did not move to Loudoun County until 2010. 2010, okay. Um, another question is, um, do you know if there was ever any feedback from the two other finalists, uh, William McVeigh and Una Hanbury, after they saw the final uh, the final sculpture? No, I don't, and I don't even know if they ever saw the final sculpture. I, my, my guess is they probably did not. I mean, there wouldn't have been any reason, I don't think, for them to have seen it. Okay. I was... Um, I'm also really struck as you were speaking just about how the community came together in a way that I've never witnessed in my time here in Loudoun County, my 20 years. Right. You know, you mentioned church leaders, Loudoun towns, the arts committee, historians, schools, dignitaries from around the around the country, really, all came together uh, around this event. And right. can you think of anyone else, living or dead, that we no. might be able to unite around in a similar have, way today? I have tried to think that answer that very same question, Susan. And no, I can't. I, I can't imagine that anything 
uh, any person would bring about this kind of event today. I think you're right. I was racking my brain as well, and I think I, I think this was a unique moment in time, and certainly a unique person who was able to bring so many people and so many uh, perspectives from around the world together. So, um, wonderful thing in that respect. And last but not least, my other question, my last question for you is: There's so many people in Loudoun County who are new, both to Loudoun County, but also new to Virginia, new to the United States, and maybe they're from a different generation. They weren't born when uh, George Marshall was living, and I wondered for those who maybe just were not educated about George Marshall growing up, what do you think is the most important legacy for them to know about George Marshall? Well, first of all, he was, he was a selfless leader. Uh, he kept uh, answering the call of his country. He did it because he thought it was his duty. Uh, he never wrote uh, any, any memoirs. Uh, he never made any money off of it. Uh, it's just an example of dedicated public service um, of a person who stepped up in many cases where his leadership was needed. And I, I think he's, he's an example for, he should be an example for many other people. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Here's another question that came in. If, if Marshall himself had seen this statue, do you think he would like it? No, I... I <laughs> I don't think he would have, he would not have allowed this if he had been alive. Uh, and I don't think he would. I mean, I think he probably, uh, he was enough of a gentleman. He wouldn't have, he wouldn't have commented on, on the appearance. Uh, but no, I, I don't think he would have liked it. I can't imagine how anybody would like it. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Last call for questions. And uh, let's see, I have two other things I just wanted to drop it quickly, which is, um, I know you put a lot of time and research into this presentation, and you've done a lot of research, of course, in the years prior anyway, um, through your work as a docent and just following George Marshall. And you have a research paper that highlights a lot of the information you shared today, and I can make that research paper available to anyone who would like a copy. I will put my email address in the chat box, and if you just um, let me know, I will email that research paper out to you. And then the other last thing is just that, of course, um, at Loudoun County Public Library, we do have a number of resources on George Marshall. We have a lot of books and uh, wanted to highlight one, which is George Marshall, A Statesman Shaped in the Crucible of War by Rachel Yarnell Thompson. Uh, uh, Thompson is a very distinguished historian who has also been affiliated with the George C. Marshall International Center. We have, so we can uh, highlight that book and others at the library if anyone wants to check out. But otherwise, I don't, let's see, I don't see any other questions have come in. So I think on behalf of the library, I just want to thank you very, very, very much for uh, doing this presentation today. I'm glad that it worked out with the technical issues that we had, and uh, it was really a wonderful, very informative presentation. So thank you so much, and I'll give you the final word. Thank you, Susan, and, and thank you for, for the invitation, and uh, thanks every, to everybody who was watching today. Great. Thank you all very much. Take care.